Is Jesus Lucifer? And did God lie in the garden? These are things that Alex O'Connor raised in his conversation with Jordan Peterson about religion that we got to talk about because no, Jesus isn't Lucifer and no, God did not lie in the garden. And so we got to explain that because those are good questions. And what else does this podcast exist for except to answer hard questions about the faith? I got to stop drinking unnamed brands of carbonation when I'm recording, but I'm not gonna. You will not surely die in the day that you eat thereof. You'll just, God just knows you'll become like him, knowing good and evil, and he doesn't want that. So Eve looks at the fruit and she eats the fruit. And does she die in the day thereof? Well, okay, so if you didn't catch that, they're just talking, uh, Alex is recounting the story of the Genesis and the Genesis story with Eve and Satan or the serpent. Um, and is uh, just recounting and is wondering, oh, did God lie? Or, or it seems like Satan is a sensible one. So here we go. Again, a complicated question, but on face value, no. She doesn't die. She gives them to Adam. He doesn't die. And what does happen? Well, God says to them, or God says, now they have become like us, knowing good and evil. They must be banished from the garden so yeah. they do not outreach, uh, outstretch their hand and, and, and eat from the tree of life. So it seems to me that you've got this serpent who could plausibly be described as the most sensible of the animals, telling Eve yeah, seemingly well, there's an immense, the, the truth. People, the people who regard Milton Satan as what an admirable revolutionary mm. tend to have the same attitude towards the serpent in the garden. And yeah. it's a complicated, it's a very complicated issue because even to the degree that the serpent is an agent of Lucifer, which I think is an extraordinarily profound what reading and overlay on that initial story. I think it's remarkable. Lucifer is the bringer of light, right? Yeah, the I mean, spirit Jesus, of enlightenment. Jesus himself is referred to as Lucifer at one point in the, in the, in the gospel, which is, which is quite a fascinating. I think he says the gospel of Thomas, maybe. I don't know, but we'll get into it. But not in the gospel, at least not, not when I looked into that. Second Peter is the only place where it refers to that is, is Jesus Lucifer. And so, yeah, that's just a really concerning thought that could throw a lot of people for a loop so let's just tackle it and guess what i'm not even gonna really even get deep into it because i got our friend michael from inspiring philosophy to share in a little youtube short about it you know like and now we're not actually friends yet in real life but maybe one day we'll meet um but yeah let's see this could Jesus, the self-proclaimed light of the world and morning star, be the same being as Lucifer, whose name in Latin literally means a light bringer and morning star? No, this is a non sequitur. They're both just described as beings of light. That doesn't mean they're the same being. If you want to get technical, Lucifer is a Latin translation of a Hebrew word that only shows up at one place in the Hebrew Bible, in Isaiah 14, 12, which describes the fall of a divine being. This word or its Greek translation are never used to describe Jesus or the other two members of the triune God. Could Jesus, the self- All right. Oh, pretty straightforward, huh? It, it, the, the term Lucifer is Latin. The Bible is not written in Latin. In the Septuagint, in, which is the Greek Old Testament, and the New Testament, the Greek words aren't the same. So, no. Now, it, it talks about, yeah, Jesus is the morning star. also says, yeah, Satan or the serpent, or I think it says Satan is the morning star. But, you know, they have different reasons. Like I said, it's different in the Greek. Um, so just because it's like the same word doesn't mean it's the same substance. And, you know, there's another video uh, Michael has. And he talks about how he just did a quick Google search. And so did I. So when you hear stuff like this that sounds concerning, just look it up. It's probably not true. Um, now, we're going to skip ahead, I think, around the one hour and 13 minute mark. Um, they asked, did God lie? So we're right before that. Because you consider this Gnostic tradition, right? The evil yeah. demiurgic creator of the universe. And, like you have, and, and, and the author of the Testimony of Truth says, you know, what God is this? What, what God is this? That, that, that firstly, you know, condemns man for wanting to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and secondly, lies to him about what's going to happen when he does. 
and and recognizes and, and we're missing like fifty percent of the text. Like it, it's it's ripped to ripped to shred. These Gnostic texts, it's fascinating. Yeah, the, I think the the Gospel of Judas spent about thirty years in a safety deposit box in New York City and nearly destroyed the whole thing. It's fascinating. So he's he's I believe he's quoting um, a Gnostic text that is, is accusing God of lying in the Old Testament around the Garden and. You know, that's a pretty big accusation to say God's lying. Um, so did God lie when he said in the day that you eat of the fruit, you will surely die in the day that they ate it? They died in the sense that they were cut off from God and they were going to die. The, 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 the coming reality of dying was started possibly before that they never were going to die. You know, the Bible says that sin, because of sin, death enters the world. That um, death is the result of sin. And so if you don't sin, you won't die. So if that's the case, if you won't sin, you won't die. Then if we didn't sin ever, would we live forever? Now, that will never happen without Christ because, and even if you have Christ, you're 99.999% likely going to still sin because we're being redeemed, we're in the process of redemption, but, you know, that's an argument for why maybe Jesus was able to also be resurrected. Yes, the Holy Spirit and God empowered him to rise from the dead, but also he never sinned, so death didn't have a right over him, technically, right? And so if Adam and Eve were never to sin, they would have never died. And so when they do eat the, the, the fruit and they're kicked out of the garden, eventually they did die. And so you could say, like, yeah, the, God was right. In the day they ate it, they died, meaning they started dying or they were separated from the source of life. But then the question is, well, why did God kick them out of the garden? And, the, and Alex mentioned it a little bit in the video and he said, um, and this is what God says, if they eat of the, they've come, they become like us, knowing good and evil. Let's kick them out of the garden so they don't eat of the tree of life. That's actually a mercy. People don't recognize that. Often it looks like a punishment, but this is actually a very merciful thing to do that if they had eaten of the tree of life after eating the tree of knowledge and good and evil they would have possibly like theoretically obviously this is all kind of more like possibly like lived forever in their state of sin so they had to be cut off from something that would give them eternal life in order that they wouldn't live forever in their sin so they could eventually receive repentance or forgiveness for their sins and enter into life eternity without sin and so that's a, a, a thing that I like to talk about when we were talking about the creation is because people don't talk about how it was God's mercy that he kicked them out so they wouldn't live in their sin forever. Um, and to add more to this, like the, the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you think about it, what does it do? It makes you knowledgeable of good and evil, right? Okay, but what was evil before that? maybe Satan and the serpent, but they had no knowledge of evil because they were so surrounded by good. And so really eating this, the reason God said don't eat this is not because he didn't want them to have cognitive understanding of morality and good and evil. It's because God did not want them to introduce evil into this world. There was nothing evil in the world. There was no evil to be known. So it's like, hey, don't eat of this because you'll introduce evil. And why did eating that introduce evil? Because they broke God's command, which is evil. They rebelled. And so because of their rebellion, evil entered into the world. And they, how do they know it was rebellion? Because they had the knowledge of good and evil. And they achieved that by rebelling. Does that make sense? Maybe not. Um, but yeah, just some, some thoughts regarding this. Jesus is not Lucifer. Um, just cause maybe the two bring light and they're different kinds of light too. Jesus, or the Bible says that Lucifer, not Lucifer, but Satan comes as an angel of light, as an angel of light or like an angel of light. He's mimicking an angel of light. He's trying to manipulate you to believe his lies. So your life ends in ruin and destruction. It says that Jesus is the lion of Judah. And it also says that Satan walks about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. That doesn't mean they're one and the same. It means Satan walks like a lion. He's trying to impersonate Jesus so he can destroy your life. And this is why it's important 
to get in the Bible, to know God's commands, to obey God's commands, to be plugged into a church that's going to keep you accountable so you don't go off into ruin following the lies of Satan. You know, um, God wants you free. God wants you free from the spiritual oppression you're under. God wants you free from anxiety and depression. God wants you free from the demons that torment you at night and keep you up and you can't sleep. And that's that freedom's only found in Christ. Um, they're not found in crystals. It's not found in new age meditations. It's not found in yoga, you know, and if you feel like, oh, but I have found freedom from these things that torment me and all these things, th- this is what it's like. It's like uh, if, I, if this is your hand and I'm squeezing it really hard and it hurts, um, maybe I let go a little bit so it stops hurting, but I am still there. That's kind of how demons might be to deceive you. You might have a demon oppressing you and then you go to maybe, an, uh, um, I don't know, yoga or, and I'm not, I'm not talking about physical pain and yoga stretching the stretching of the muscles relieving you. I'm talking about like demonic oppression, right? Maybe you have sleep terrors and you go to a fortune teller and they do this. They tell you to do some things and you obey. And then, you know, the, the night terror stop. That just means the demons just have decided to not mess with you in that way right now. Cause you're still enslaved though. You know, well, well, Jesus comes in and sees those demons. He kicks them out. He rebukes them. And then he fills you with his spirit. That is, that is stronger and, and more fulfilling and, gives life and peace and restoration. You know, you don't need to go to all these other things. You have the Holy Spirit now once you repent. Uh, Jesus wants to get rid of the root, not just um, make you think the root's gone. But yeah, uh, give your life to Jesus, and Jesus is not Lucifer, and God doesn't lie. See ya.